The White House recently announced that nine federal agencies will release new rules they say will ensure religious and non-religious organizations are treated equally under the law. When it comes to the Department of Health and Human Services, there are two parts to the proposed changes. First, faith-based health and social service providers receiving federal funds no longer would have to inform clients about services they don't provide for religious reasons. And they no longer have to refer them to alternative providers. Secondly, HHS will not discriminate against faith-based organizations on applications for grants on the basis of that organization's religious policies. Joining me to help make sense of all of these new proposed rules and much more is the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar. Secretary Azar, thank you for being Great here. Great to see you, Raymond. Now, I want to start with these new rules, okay? Now, this permits religious organizations, according to, it gives them a lot of leeway in areas that they, they had been restricted in the past. Now, some are saying this is discriminatory, discriminatory against certain groups. In what way is it, why did you decide to move these rules now? So what President Trump did last week is announce that across over nine different agencies right. in the federal government were ending discrimination against faith-based providers. Mm -hmm. What the Obama administration had put in place at these agencies were regulations that required that if you were a faith-based provider, you had to warn individuals About, that you were faith-based. Right. And, you had and, to wear a, they, it's been called a scarlet R for religious. You had to wear your scarlet R, and, warn them you're faith-based, and provide them referrals to tell them you can get your services from a non-faith-based provider. Mm -hmm. We're getting rid of those requirements. We're treating faith-based providers the same way secular providers are treated, getting rid of this patent discrimination against faith-based faith -based providers, and that's at President Trump's direction. The human rights campaign and others have come out against you. I want to read what the human rights campaign are saying about these proposed this proposed new rule the rule empowers health care providers doctors nurses and even non-medical support staff like receptionists to deny even potentially life-saving care to lgbtq people women and other vulnerable communities on the basis of the workers personal beliefs does this new rule allow discrimination so, no, this rule is not about that. This rule is actually preventing discrimination against faith-based providers. They need to read the rule. I think their press release is a little dated. I think they pulled an old one off the shelf and uh, accidentally <laughs> it put off. it out. Um, listen, we believe that all individuals, every human being, deserves to be treated in the health care system with dignity and respect. We absolutely believe that. On but I want to get into the second part of this rule, which states that the HHS will not discriminate against faith-based groups that apply for grants or awards, uh, just like any other group, on the basis of religion they can't be discriminated against. In what way are they being discriminated against now? Well, again, what's happening now under the Obama regulation that we are, that we are proposing to get rid of is they have to wear a scarlet R that says we are a religious, mm -hmm. a faith-based provider, and if you don't want to be get your services from us, remember, it's not the types of services you're getting. Yeah. It's not that they're offering different services. Mm -hmm. They're offering the same services as a secular provider, but because there was such discrimination against faith-based providers, they were required to announce and advertise, we are faith-based, and if you want to get your services from somebody else, if you don't want to get your services from us, go over here. Here we'll refer you to someone else who's not, who's a secular provider of these same services. And let's face it, most of, most of the, these, these rules were written to support and advance the abortion industry. Right. I mean, that's who it's to protect. Agenda. It's to support, well, to support an agenda or support an agenda that was hostile to faith-based providers. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I need to get into a very important meeting that you held last week with ambassadors, some high-level diplomats from around the world. In that meeting, you reiterated something you said this past September at the U.N., and it was basically this. There is no international human right to abortion. On the other hand, there is an international human right to life. Now, here's my question. That statement obviously was intended for the U.N., the World Health Organization, because they like to use those ambiguous terms like sexual and reproductive health rights. And uh, I, I can remember going back to the Cairo conference in the 90s when you had the Clinton administration pushing abortion as a universal human right. 
Where does this stand now, and are there other countries joining the administration in this position? So over the last year, Raymond, we have led a historic effort to assemble countries around the world who believe life begins at conception and who stand up for the value of life in these multilateral settings. You see, what has happened for too long is that other countries and these multilateral organizations have tried to force an agenda of abortion on demand on to other countries. We're standing up for national sovereignty and saying, we as a country are actually deeply divided on this issue, but we have, a, we have the most pro-life president in American history, and it's the agenda that we pursue. Mm. And you should respect other countries that have a similar perspective. We're not trying to convince the French or others that they should have that pro-life perspective, but, they, but other countries should respect the fact that we and other countries have that. And so over the last year, Secretary Pompeo, the Vi right. Vice President Pence, and I have led an effort to assemble countries who are just standing up and saying, we will be heard. You may not condescend to us. You may not put in UN and World Health Organization resolutions vague references to sexual and reproductive freedom, reproductive health, that then left-wing bureaucrats afterwards use to purport to say that the nations of the world have adopted an international human right to abortion. And we have assembled over people representing over a billion, countries representing over a billion people on the face of this planet who are standing up and being counted. And by the United States, with our power and the respect we hold around the world, standing up and doing that, we have emboldened and we have granted courage to smaller countries. Remember, so many of these countries that we've assembled together are smaller. They might be donor, they might be recipients yeah. of development aid. And the big powerful countries that are pursuing an activist social agenda tie receipt of that aid to support for their abortion agenda in, in country. Inter international fora. Mm -hmm. And we're standing up as the United States and offering an umbrella of protection to them to say, we respect your national sovereignty. Respect ours. We respect yours. And we will stand up and defend you in these international fora. Secretary Azar, I was talking to some pro-life advocates, people who've been doing this for years. I was frankly shocked at how, um, how do I put this, grudging they were in their praise and acknowledgement of what's happened over the last three years or so. Does that shock you, that That's people don't give the Trump administration its due in this area? I mean, as you said a moment ago, you can like him, you can dislike him, you might, you, you might like the tweets or don't like the tweets. Look at the policies. It's hard to quibble with that if, if pro-life is your issue. Uh, I would be dumbfounded by that <clears throat> if anyone who comes from the pro-life community would be in any way begrudging. President Trump is, and I say this without hesitation, the most pro-life president in the history of the United States. And he combines actually a deep commitment on these pro-life issues with something that is often lacking in presidents, courage mm. to act against that. I have never had an interaction with the president where he has hesitated and expressed timidity on these issues. He has said, we will stand for life at conception. We will stand for the protection of conscience. We will stand for religious freedom. We can balance these things in our country. We, have a, we are a great country, and we can respect the difference of views on this. Mm -hmm. we, can balance, we can respect people's religion while still offering services to people. We can stand up for the unborn. We can protect life from the moment of conception until natural death. And he's uncompromising, unwavering, and courageous in that commitment. I work with him every day, and I can tell you, I see this, I experience this firsthand. Mm. You're going to be at the March for Life? I will. Are you marching? I will. Really? Why? Because I believe in life, beginning at the moment of conception. I run the Department of Life. My mm. department is about enhancing human life in all of its forms from the moment of conception until natural death. We want the experience in human, we want, we want children to be born, we want the children who are born to be healthy, we want people through their life to be fulfilled, to live longer, healthier, happier lives. We want to improve the human condition here and around the globe. My whole department is committed to the sense of making life better. Mm. Um, and so for me, as the secretary of that department, uh, but also just my own personal commitment on this issue, mm -hmm. I think it's important to stand up and be counted yeah. as President Trump and Vice President Pence stand up and are counted. Picking up on that, and, and the, the, really this department does protect and advance life in its various forms. A recent Politico Morning Consult poll found that 50% of people surveyed gave the president a D or an F vis-a-vis health care. Health care costs have skyrocketed since Obamacare, let's be honest, in 2009. Uh, in an interview on Tuesday, you said there really is no need for the Trump administration to come up with a replacement for Obamacare. Why not? 
Well, what I said is until there's a final decision by the Supreme Court of the United States overturning all or a large part of the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. or until there's a Congress that's actually willing to have a serious discussion about the Affordable Care Act and replacing it with something that actually works for people, we have ideas. Yeah. We, have, we, we have spent, I personally have spent over a year and a half working on how one might structure and think about <clears throat> alternatives that actually create an individual insurance market that works for people. Mm. But that's well, right not, now you're stuck <clears throat> in this marketplace that, we're, that, we're that here. Congress and, and, and the Except Obama administration for now, gave. For now, work with the reality, which is as long as the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land, the president and I are going to run that program as well as it can be run. And President Trump is running it better than the guy whose name is on the program. Mm -hmm. We have for two years in a row seen decreasing premiums. We have increased choice in the program. We have created exit rights for people. The president got rid of the individual mandate. Mm -hmm. the, we have created association health plans, short-term limited duration plans, health reimbursement accounts, alternatives for those who are left behind by the overpriced, overregulated Affordable Care Act plans. But mm -hmm. while they're there, we're going to make them work as well as they can. Well, but it's important also to remember, the Affordable Care Act is a part of health care in the individual market at its core. Mm. There are 331 million Americans. 180 million of us get our insurance through our employer or our union. 60 million get it through Medicare. Others get it through Medicaid. Most people are actually quite happy with their health insurance and how that's working. The president wants to protect it and make it better. Mm -hmm. So he's got an agenda. It's an agenda that is broader, I think, than any president has ever had around health care, which is protect what works, make it better on health financing, create options for people while we still have the Affordable Care Act. Then fix health care, make it more affordable, more choice, more private sector, more patient centric mm -hmm. for all 331 million Americans through greater transparency of prices, through interoperable health information technology, through lower drug prices. Mm -hmm. Then tackle the most intractable diseases and health care issues that our country faces that no president's been willing to grab onto before. So, for instance, fix kidney care. Uh, mm -hmm. One out of five dollars in Medicare is spent on people with end-stage renal disease and their complications. Mm -hmm. Keep people from progressing with kidney disease. Make home-based dialysis available instead of having to go to a center. Facility. Double the number of transplants available for individuals with kidney disease. End the HIV epidemic in the United States. Solve maternal mortality in the United States. Fix the rural health care crisis in this country. Address social determinants of health. This is a comprehensive, multi-factor, sophisticated agenda mm -hmm. that reaches across 331 million Americans instead of a maniacal focus, although it is very important on the individual market because it's not working, but until there's a political will for to fully address and fix that, we continue to focus on the broad health care system and we are delivering results. The president keeps saying there is a master plan. You have an you have a plan for health care yes. and it's coming soon. But that is exactly what I just told is that, you. Is that what it is? That is, is that the overview of the that plan? That is exactly the overall plan for health care in the United mm -hmm. States is to create a personalized patient centric health care system that puts you, the patient, in control, that treats you like a human being and not like a number. Compare that to Medicare for All, a government-run health care system that takes away from you what you value in your health care system, your insurance, your doctor, your hospital, mm -hmm. makes you a number, not an individual. I know lowering prescription drugs has been a big priority, not only for you, but for the president. That's right. Uh, there are some plans out there, one allowing imports from Canada and other countries, as well as tying certain drug payments to, the, to their prices of the developed countries that they're, they're abroad. How do these measures drive the price of drugs down and how close are you? So we are using every tool that we have uh, as in terms of administrative authority mm -hmm. to try to get prices down. So the president is enabling importation of drugs from Canada, uh, that, st that state programs that would allow for importation of drugs from Canada to make them available. Right. Um, the president has looked at, like you said, allowing um, our government's programs to base their pricing off of the deals that pharma companies are giving to other countries. Mm -hmm. um, we have ended gag clauses where, dr where the pharmacy benefit managers, these insurance middlemen, were ordering pharmacists to not tell you that you could get your drugs cheaper just by paying 
in cash. We've given our Medicare plans more authority to negotiate against the drug companies. But there is only so much that we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we've approved historic levels of generic, branded, and right. biosimilar drugs, mm -hmm. uh, leading to prescription retail prescription drug prices are down for the first time in 40 years in this country as a result of these actions. But there's still only so much that we can do, and that's why we're working on a bipartisan basis with Congress to implement further, even deeper reforms. And you are a proponent of the grassley widen bill. That's one approach. It is. It is. It do is. You an support approach. it. I do support it. But it's one approach. If we can, if if there are other compromises, what would that do? Explain approaches. to people what yeah. what that bill would do. Yeah. Because let's let's be honest, Leader McConnell and others are opposed to that bill. Mm -hmm. You were at Eli Lilly for years. I, I imagine your old your old company would not be receptive to this either. Well, what would what, the bill do? What Grassley Wyden does, first it's bipartisan, uh, what it would do is restructure the Medicare drug, disc, the drug program that we have for senior citizens, and it would say for the first time ever there would be a $3,100 catastrophic cap each year. That means that no senior would ever spend more than $3,100 a year on their drugs out of pocket. Mm. Right now, you have to keep spending 5% in infinity yeah, right. uh, during that year. That would cap that at $3,100. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, it also would allow that $3,100 cap to be spread out month by month if the senior wanted, meaning no senior would spend more than about $260 per month mm. for their drugs out of pocket, no matter what their drug expenses are. Mm. In addition, and this is where pharma gets a little queasy, Yeah. in addition, it would create inflation penalties that if the drug companies keep their programs of jacking up without cause the list price of their drugs, they would have a penalty if they increased above the rate of inflation. Um, so because we every, every January 1st, every July 1st, we see this wave of drug price yep. increases. And really what it is, it's a mechanism where the drug companies jack up their list price to create more money that they can funnel to these middlemen, these pharmacy benefit managers, mm. so that they can get preferred status on the formulas, meaning they get preferred treatment when you walk into the pharmacy. You only That's pay safe. 20 bucks, pay 25 bucks instead of paying 400 bucks mm. for the prescription because mm. we use it more. Yeah. So they, they create this money basically to funnel to the pharmacy benefit managers. But who suffers? The, patients, the, the patient yeah. suffers who's paying out of pocket for their drugs if they don't have insurance or if they're mm. in a deductible. I have to move on to this vaping epidemic we're seeing in the country. Now, your administration has, uh, you moved to stop the manufacturing and distribution of these flavored e-cigarettes because so many young people, minors, are really addicted and becoming addicted to these e-cigarettes. Uh, you also warned manufacturers that continue to sell and merchandise these uh, certain electronic nicotine delivery systems, that, that there'll be FDA penalties. What might the FDA do? What are those actions you're planning to take? So it's important for people to remember that, to, that the Tobacco Control Act actually set up a system where if you're going to have a nicotine delivery device, which is a tobacco product, mm -hmm. and it's a new, new, new product, it has to come through FDA approval. It's actually mm -hmm. got to come and get authorized by the FDA. Mm -hmm. Well, initially the thinking was let's let these products, which were starting to be on the market, be out there so that we can help people who are stuck on combustible get tobacco off maybe get off of it because mm -hmm. it might be better for them. Well, the problem is all of a sudden there were these very small devices, pod-based devices right. people are familiar with, mm -hmm. um, that just skyrocketed all of a sudden. Yep. And they had kid attractive flavors like mango, bubble gum, right. orange sickle, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. And it drew kids in. And so that caused us to have to reevaluate the fact that we were not enforcing the law. The Obama administration yeah. and then we, um, these products, there is not a single one of these e-cigarette products on the market that is legally on the market today. Wow. We are only not enforcing the law against them because they have to come into FDA to get authorization. So what is the FDA prepared to do? Well, so there's a court order that told us you have to require all of these to come in by May of 2020 to seek approval. Or? Um, uh, or you'll, be face, you'll face penalties under the, food, under the Tobacco Control Act. Mm -hmm. um, the, what, the pro what we have rolled out is a program that says, in the interim, the products that are most attractive to children, and these are these pod-based, mm -hmm. you know, the sickly sweet flavors, the mangoes, yeah. the mints, the bubble gums, um, those products actually need to come off the market now until you get authorization by the FDA, yeah. um, consistent with the law, so that you will be out there in a form and format that is not attractive to kids and not available to kids. But we're respecting the fact that we've got many adults who are using these to stay off of combustible tobacco. Yeah. So we've left tobacco flavor and menthol, menthol. flavor mm -hmm. on the market for them. But we've also made it clear, if, 
if any company or any entity sells, distributes, pushes their drug markets to children, we'll use the full weight of the law to enforce against you, even if your product is left on the market. We've also made it clear um, the kids aren't using these it's called open tank vaping systems, yeah. mini bongs, if right. you to right. use the old parlance. Yeah. Um, they're, that's not no, what, they're, they're that's not what little... kids are using. They're, they're, we, any of us who have teenage kids, mm -hmm. and I do, you see it at schools, you see it at private yep. schools, you see it at public schools. And what we're doing is we're re-empowering parents, teachers, and school administrators who have felt for the last couple of years helpless as five million children have become addicted to these right. nicotine delivery devices. But they're so concealable. They can hide them in their hoodie. Their pocket, yeah. You know, one of my colleagues, her her daughter came home from school and said, Mom, why did they, you know, why did they put toilets in the vaping room at school? <laughs> you know, it's 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 so concealable that you can't smell. It, they get we're, so what we've done is we've re-empowered parents. And I hear gratitude every day from parents on that. We want to respect adults who want to vape. We're not. Yeah. But now no, the kids are no, hooked on nicotine, right. which is the opposite of what that's everybody right. thought would yeah. come from and these that's electronic not, that's devices. That's a very bad thing. For these oh. children's developing brains, the nicotine addiction is just dreadful for them. It's very bad. Your reaction to reports that the president was unhappy, that he waded into banning these flavored mm -hmm. e-cigarettes because of the pushback he's gotten from within his base and, and, and some of the companies promoting these we, things. We, be, we believe we've struck a, a very good balance. The president ran a very thoughtful process. We heard from all sides. We had a televised meeting in the cabinet room yeah. with all sides there and tried to strike a good balance between public health and those who have an interest in vaping because, again, we're, we're not trying to keep adults um, from access to vaping equipment or e-cigarettes, mm -hmm. but we do have to take measures. We have a duty to keep these out of the hands of kids. Well, we've got 5.4 5. 5. million right. high schoolers and middle schoolers using these devices. Yeah, you know, so 1.8 1, 1, 1. million kids have used an e-cigarette um, 20 of the last 30 days. 1 million kids have used an e-cigarette every single day of the last 30 days. Wow. I need to I, ask I, you. I can't not. I can't not. I no, it, not it's a health crisis. You'd be negligent if you didn't right. if you didn't address this because it's yep. something parents and as you said, when you have high schoolers or middle schoolers that you're, that you're a parent of, yep. you see it. It's right. obvious. You see it when you pick kids up. You see it at the mall. You see it at the movie theater. It's everywhere. Before I let you go, there is another uh, health crisis blossoming in China. Mm -hmm. This uh, coronavirus. Mm -hmm. I know you've been screening people. Now it looks like the Chinese have shut down uh, the city of uh, Wuhan. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Uh, well, any any effective measure to prevent the spread of this disease is an important one. I defer to the Chinese on the situation on the ground mm -hmm. there. What we use in public health is a multi-tiered approach. So first, the first and foremost most important thing we can do is what we in the United States did from day one here, which is we educated our doctors and hospitals to be on the lookout for symptoms because if you identify cases, you isolate them. That's how you stop this disease in its mm -hmm. tracks. The other thing you do, a multi-tiered approach. Screen? How are we screening people uh, at so, these airports? Uh, so at the airports. Our airports. Yes. Yeah, so also, you, you, you put reasonable measures in to screen individuals coming to the country from affected areas. So we receive flights. Most of our flights from um, the Wuhan uh, city come into certain airports. And so we enacted some time ago at LAX, at San Francisco, and at JFK screening where if you came from that city in China, mm -hmm. you would have temperature checked, you'd be screened for any kind of pulmonary respiratory illness. If you wow. evidenced any symptoms like that, you would be isolated and you would be tested. We invented a mm -hmm. test to test for this um, novel coronavirus at the CDC. Wow. You'd be tested for that. Um, in addition, we've now expanded to five airports. We've added Chicago and Atlanta, so that covers 84 percent of the people coming from that city. Mm -hmm. And as to the other 16 percent, working with the Department of Homeland Security, we are funneling those individuals odd to different flights where they will have to enter the country through one of those five cities so, mm -hmm. so that they will be screened. So it's under control. It, this is a SARS-like. It, it is SARS-like would be the way to think about it. Uh -huh. We still don't know the full epidemiological profile of this virus. It's very early. It's a, it's a potentially serious public health issue, but we're taking the appropriate public health measures. We're working very collaboratively with China and the World Health Organization mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that we slow and stop its spread. Um, but we had a case in the state of Washington. The individual okay. came into the country from Wuhan. Uh, they were not symptomatic, so they wouldn't have even been been caught in a screening. But thanks to the great work of the CDC, 
the doctors immediately recognized this as a potential case. Individual from Wuhan with res respiratory symptoms and fever, positive identification, individuals in isolation, and they're doing well. We're now working as we trace the con close context of that individual to ensure those individuals are monitored mm -hmm. and will appropriately be isolated if they show any symptoms also. But before I let you yeah. go, Secretary Azar, you were instrumental in rewriting that rule that we talked about a little earlier, the contraceptive rule in Obamacare. Right. I'm going to talk to the general counsel of the Little Sisters of the Poor, who are still fighting this out at the high court. Why are they still subjected to this after you all changed the rule in question, which was you don't have to provide religious-based entities, religious uh, organizations, nonprofits, do not have to comply with the Obamacare rule? So we changed the rule, right? and we're fighting it out in court. <clears throat> we're fighting it out in court. That's, that's, that's the issue. So uh, we, can only, we can only do so much if the courts, uh, if the courts get involved. Mm -hmm. But we're, we'll keep fighting it. We're, we feel very strongly about this issue. It's a matter of respect, respecting religious yeah. liberty and conscience, as we talked about earlier. And you wanted to break a little news, you told us. Yeah, earlier. I wanted to let you know, yesterday we had a very important announcement with Governor Abbott in the state of Texas. Oh. So uh, the state of Texas has a family planning program in their Medicaid program for okay. uninsured women up to 200% of the federal poverty level. They have a state law that says that, that per participants in that program may not provide abortion services. Oh. The Obama administration said because of that, you're, you cannot have Medicaid pay for that program. Huh. Yesterday, I approved the state of Texas to re-implement that program as a matter and fund it by Medicaid consistent with state law. Mm, so you, you granted them a waiver. We granted, so the they we granted them the project. Continue yep. doing it. Excellent. Secretary Azar, good to see thank you. Thanks you for, for being all you here. Do. Thank you for the time. And, uh, and I hope you'll come back. Thank you. Thank you.